Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's nice to see you all here this afternoon. My name is Andy DePaulo. I'm the Senior Associate Dean in the School of Engineering. And I'm also director of something called the Stanford Center for Professional Development. And you're sitting in one of those rooms now, and our colleagues who are watching via television on the web are participating in that fashion. And let me tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do as we move forward to introduce Doug. Uh, the Center for Professional Development is part of the School of Engineering, and it extends its curriculum and its short course offerings and professional development offerings to engineers, scientists, professionals worldwide. So you're part of one of those events. For a number of years, we've been using the internet to deliver these, uh, these programs. It's also matched to a wide range of uh, conventional delivery technologies, satellite, broadcast television, videotape. So we've been pushing pretty hard on the net side of it. Uh, as you entered, some of you may have picked up some materials, a brochure which says Stanford Online, another one which indicates the kinds of programs and services that we offer, principally people who are in technology professions. Now I'm just curious, how many people here are from an industrial base? Raise your hand. How many people here from a university setting or an educational setting? From a medical setting or pharmaceutical company? Independent consultant covering the waterfront for anything. <laughs> well, and if you're not one of those, I guess you're in the wrong room and you should look for somebody else. Nonprofit. So Thank you, a nonprofit as well. Excuse me. Thanks. Thank you. We're delighted to host uh, Doug Engelbart. Uh, in fact, uh, Doug uh, has worked with us on and off for the last few years and he has some, as you know, some wonderful things to share and we are absolutely pleased that he will be with us in the next uh, 10 weeks. Uh, this program is sponsored by two faculty members. Uh, one is, uh, is Professor Jean-Claude Latome, who's the chair of the Computer Science Department, who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight. The second is Professor Terry Winograd, who's uh, r really a researcher, expert, and author in uh, human-computer interaction. Some of you may know his text, Bringing Design to Software. I've asked Terry to join us to introduce Doug and to get this program moving along. So again, thank you for being here. We appreciate your attendance, and we look forward to a very strong and dynamic next 10 weeks. Thanks very much. Terry? Thanks to Andy and Paul and all the others from the Stanford Center of Professional Development who've uh, done a lot of good work, as you can see, to, to make this possible. Um, in introducing someone like Doug, I have the luxury of being able to leave out all of the standard kinds of biographical and career details. Uh, the fact that you're here today uh, is because you know about his past achievements and who he is, uh, and you, like, like the rest of us, are focused on what's next, on the future. Um, I'm pleased to be able to help co-sponsor this event. Uh, in a way, it's a continuation of an event we had here uh, a little over a year ago, uh, sponsored by the Stanford Libraries, uh, called Engelbart's Unfinished Revolution, in which I also had the, the pleasure of being able to participate and <coughs> talk about some of Doug's work. Um, that was a kind of unprecedented event, if those of you who, for those of you who were there know that. Uh, and that suited Doug very well, because he's a unique kind of person even in an environment here in Silicon Valley that's full of daring thinkers and people who really try things and come up with new things. He stands out. Uh, and it's because his vision is really not about technology, but about people and the ways that they use technology. Uh, although he's probably best known in the world for his technical developments, like the mouse, uh, that's not what Doug has really ever cared about. Uh, he cares about it only because it's a means towards what he does care about most, which is improving the way that people work, uh, the way that they live. From the beginning of his work, uh, which is now more than three decades ago, uh, his focus has really been on, as he used the phrase, augmenting uh, the potential for what people can do. Um, he's a utopian in the best sense of that word, not an impractical dreamer, uh, but somebody who really believes that it's possible to improve the way that people work. And, there's a potential for, for doing things in new ways, doing things in better ways. But, as the title of this event and the previous event imply, the revolution is unfinished. And Doug, who's a good revolutionary, uh, knows that he can't finish it himself. That's not the way revolutions happen. Uh, and that's where this course got started. This is not your standard kind of course where somebody gets up and presents a body of material that's all been worked out and here's what you need to know. Uh, instead, it's an invitation. It's an invitation from somebody with years of valuable experience and knowledge and understanding uh, who is now seeking new knowledge, He's still looking for the new possibilities. Um, it's an invitation to learn, but even more than that, it's an invitation for you, for all of us to think. And even more than that, an invitation to do. 
um, to help in the lifelong, Doug's lifelong effort to bring technology and people together uh, in the interest of augmenting our abilities and improving our lives. And that's why we're here, and that's why I welcome Doug Engelbart. I was sitting there thinking I'd almost rather listen to him. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to make, make clear too that, that uh, the unfinished revolution, it isn't my personal revolution, it's just what I think can happen and I hope happens and it won't happen unless the world gets more conscious or explicitly interested in making it happen. Uh, the evolution that's going on now is flopping around so Today I hope to give you enough perception about why I think that unless there's some explicit action taken, uh, it's not going to go very fast and there is some strategically oriented thing to do. But it involves, you know, a worldwide activity. And so this is one of the pleasures then for getting this webcast and then later being installed so it could be referred to and then building up a repository around it and just inviting people all over the world, actually, hey, to start participating. And uh, I can just back up while all the people who know how to do things can start making a community work and get something done in this. So with that, um, I'll proceed. Um, you know, of all the, all the demonstrations I've given through all the years, I just think, I think I'm unflappable. So if, if anything falls apart today, it won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just want to briefly uh, acknowledge a number of people that have made a difference that around, like my daughter Christina sitting over there is... Uh, <laughs> that almost made me flap. <laughs> so... Uh, she'd been involved uh, working professionally with this material since, oh, uh, 68, 78 actually, and then a period of being a, she and her husband did a startup and all. And then she, uh, she came and helped me set up the Bootstrap Institute in 1989 and been working very heavily ever since for it and uh, a little bit of uh, uh, emergency retreat in the last few months, but anyway, she, she I have to acknowledge a whole lot. And Jeff Rulison, he's the one over there, <laughs> who, who uh, once uh, came to work in my laboratory in the late 60s and made a con you know, very definite technical contribution. And then in the last three years, he's been making a big difference in helping us get this bootstrapping going. And Marcelo Hoffman, where is he? Oh, right here. Yes, he's he, working at SRI, came to one of our seminars about eight years ago and then since then has been really contributing a lot taking sometimes taking vacation time to help us write our proposals etc then Pat Rush and Mary Dye who aren't here uh, came came up a year ago to start helping and uh, are helping from Chicago so we'll hear from Pat Rush a little later today and Peter Yim sitting over there in the corner put your hand way up Peter <laughs> he, he showed up uh, last spring and was volunteering and slowly I began to realize he really meant he wants to volunteer and work and pretty soon he was he, he quit his other activities were working full time and uh, so it, it, without him this this whole thing wouldn't have been able to come off and uh, he's had to stress and do things for instance uh, I'm unflappable up here like this but I'm also not a very good manager at all so it takes somebody like Peter <laughs> it's always taken somebody Christina or Peter or Bill English <laughs> to make things work around me. And then the other two, next two people, Pierre Luigi Zappacosta and Dan Lynch, both contributed significant pieces of money to help make this, this particular thing come off. And then Andy Paolo and Terry Renegrad, you've already, and, and John Cloud, you've uh, already been announced, but I do appreciate very much uh, getting together and letting us use this as outsiders, be able to use the Stanford thing. And then the companies that have contributed are Sun Microsystems, Logitech, SRI, and I think the whole staff, uh, the, the Stanford Center for Professional Development that Andy DiPaolo heads. Uh, I was very impressed with all of that. So 
Thank you. Um, okay, as Terry pointed out, there's been a goal I've been following for a long time. It's 49 years ago <laughs> uh, that I, in some wild moment, committed my professional career to seeing if how much I could maximize my career's contribution toward this thing of helping mankind's collective ability for coping with complex urgent problems. Getting the picture even in 1951 of interactively using a computer. And that shows you how impractical I am because <laughs> the nearest working computer was probably at MIT <laughs> at the time here. But anyway, that's, that's been the goal pushing me ever, ever since. So like any, anybody does who doesn't know that much about what's going to happen, you'll, oh, I'll go to graduate school. So I went to Berkeley. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> they were building a computer. And so then I got a PhD in 56 and uh, came down to work at SRI in 57 and then was there until 77, 78, uh, in which we did a lot of, a lot of things. But so uh, there are many things that happened during those years which were valuable lessons to me and I'll just mention a few of them. Like one of them was that in the late 50s I began trying to to, I didn't have any research money to do this kind of pursuit, but I kept trying to describe it to people, and I'd give talks, etc. And uh, I, I just had exactly these particular three things that are under there. I gave a talk, and uh, the first one is, but all I need, all I need is a 20-minute turnaround time for putting in my punch cards, and if it turns around in 20 minutes, why do I? What would value would I get by interacting with a computer? Well, that was a, a friend of mine who was who started the computer science here at, at Stanford, <laughs> George Forsyth. So I talked to that group like that. And he was very honestly wondered how, how you'd get more value than a 20-minute turnaround. So paradigms. Uh, it's very, very hard to explain all the interactions, what you would do. Then another group I gave a talk to about this thing, and they were totally convinced that all I was talking about was information retrieval. And that was their specialty. And they really... I thought they were going to attack me because they were, I'm unflappable, of course. <laughs> but they, they uh, really felt angry that here I was, an engineer, trying to talk about all this stuff, and all you're talking about is a computer doing information retrieval for you, and that's our business. And I could, you know, I had 10 or 15 minutes uh, trying to describe to them what I meant, and it didn't work. But paradigm, see. And then another one was cognitive psychologist, and that's his picture was all you're talking about and this augmenting thing is cognitive psychology. And uh, so I really learned things from that and a few others that got me to realize that, that you have to set up a paradigm or a conceptual framework, as the term was in those days. So that's what I began to do. And one of the valuable things I got a chance in the late 80s to do a research study about dimensional scaling of electronic components. And I was just sure if you're going to do interactive computing and all that to any great extent, that the components would have to get a lot cheaper and faster and smaller. And uh, so what happens when you make things small? So I got a research contract and I started looking into that and it turns out physicists have done a lot of work upon dimensional scaling and has some nice abstract con concepts. And you plug them in here and then you get to realizing that the more I studied, the more it became clear that that, you know, you make a small change in the size and it oftentimes makes a noticeable quantitative change, but it, pretty soon the change gets large enough that you begin to get qualitative changes. And then if you get even larger ones, you get really surprising qualitative changes. And it was that thing about the really surprising ones that just was an extremely valuable lesson for me that I'll point to a little later when we're getting to but anyway, <clears throat> these, are, these are some things that most people wouldn't know how to answer. Like, if you were as small as a, as a mosquito, what would it be like for you? Well, in the first place, you'd be extremely over-muscled, etc. And uh, if you flapped your hands fast enough, you might even be able to fly. And gravity would have almost zero meaning to you. And there you have a small problem, though. Uh, you got this blunt face, etc., and you'd get thirsty, and so you you find a place of water and you go up to take a drink and the surface tension, the water, would not let you get in unless you bonked. 
And then what would happen is your face would get wet and the surface tension will suck you right in. See, so that's why mosquitoes do well with these big, long, skinny noses, stuff like that. So these things are surprises, right? So if gravity were, or if, t if you were 10 times larger, it would turn out that you, you couldn't move. You'd weigh a thousand times as much, but you would only be a hundred times as strong. So it'd be like if right now you weigh 1,500 pounds or, or 1,000 or 1,200 or something like that with your current muscles, etc. This you would just couldn't move. And if you stumbled, you'd break bones. And you'd have trouble breathing because you only have, you know, you, you, the ratio of, of lung surface to body metabolism is 10 to 1 at that point, stuff like that. So these are just things that you don't, don't think about, surprises. So I'll say, and if digital technology was smaller or faster or cheaper by a factor of 100 or 1,000 or a million or 10 million, what would that do? So these are things, as we talk on, just keep that in mind that this relative scale business is very, very critical. And it's part of the paradigm bottleneck that we're having, that I feel we're having. If we're going to go after this revolution, people say, what revolution? Boy, we're already doing e-commerce and I'm on the web. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, this, this is a very telling thing that in the face of the greatest avalanche of pervasive global change that ever, ever, ever faced by human society. That's a scaling thing. The amount of change being introduced and principally or just, you could just only credit it all if you wanted to, to digital technology getting so pervasive and cheap, etc. Going to hit every place in the world. It's going to start changing a lot of things. It's going to, it just makes more change than we ever, ever, any society ever had to accommodate in that time. So if our paradigms don't get unlimited, <laughs> don't get un unchecked like that, we're going to have a dangerous time about it. So what I'm, a big part of today is, is trying to open some of the paradigms about scale, and then you realize that the scales of things get large enough, you have to think in a different way about what you're going to do about it. And that different way comes about, in a sense, a sort of a really strategic way instead of a frontal attack. So this key thing here then is, is look at the human organiz organization. <coughs> We're talking about collective action. So I found it very meaningful to consider any human organization as a social organism, because there's some very, very real connotations associated with that. And one of the things you look at if you if you put an envelope around any organization you know and you said, I'm just observing from the outside world how that behaves. So how do I judge how smart that is by how quickly it sort of senses what's going on in the world that's important to it and takes, takes some action and how well it coordinates its resources. This, this arm would be reaching for something and this is trying to slap it away. Uh, you know, human organization is it's very strange. But also the, the issue then of collective IQ, I, it's not just a buzzword, it's something very meaningful to me and I think it, it's meaningful. These are the kind of things about which subsequent dialogue would be very valuable to get more people in the world trying to look at this seriously. And after they bang me around a little bit and find that I'm unflappable, <laughs> I'd probably go home and cry maybe, but <laughs> otherwise. Uh, anyway. So anyway, evolution has been happening to human organizations all the time. So in this case, this radically improved nervous system, bingo, it's just within a few decades, the digital technology acting as a potential nervous system. And so these were things I was writing about in 1960, you know, saying, hey, that's what it, it is, essentially. And you take any given organism, a biological one, and if you uh, suddenly make its nervous system immensely more effective. It's sensory and it's perceptual and it's motor control, etc., things like that, and it's cognitive. He says, wow, what's going to happen? Is it just so you do that for, say, a lizard? And he says, oh boy, it'll be a lot smarter lizard. And then you begin to think about it more and you realize that the evolution from there on, learning how to co-evolve the rest of it to harness that kind of nervous system, would begin evolving into a very, very different creature than just be a smart lizard. So this is the kind of thing we uh, got like that. So anyway, 
There are various ecological niche niches in which evolution takes place. So organisms that find themselves in one evolution niche will grow in one way and those in another will evolve. So this is, this is already happening out in our world, like the ones that are doing an e-business, e-commerce, if that's the world they're in, boy, they have to get going. And those that are not affected by it don't. <clears throat> but there's some aspects of that in which it's extremely important that the niches don't get sort of too far away from each other. And one of the things then to do would be how do you sort of, in, in your niche or the people, the organizations in your niche, sort of keep track of the others because there are a lot of things happening that can either be hazards or really things to benefit from or copy. <coughs> <coughs> and so the, another aspect of it is, is while well, any organization that you're particularly concerned with is evolving to learn how to harness all this better, oops, you have to realize that you have to watch the environment you're working in, the other organizations, because if they're all evolving, if you're not paying attention to how they evolve, they'd be evolving one way and pretty soon you're out of touch or out of sync or something with them. So there's that double pressure on the evolution of every organization of how you evolve to be more capable and effective and efficient in all those different terms, uh, but also how you stay in synchronization with the rest of the environment, which, which is, I don't think that's being cared for very much like that. So anyway, <clears throat> in, in the whole time of this colloquium, there, there may be 15 or so special terms and concepts that all end up being interconnected in this framework. And so one of them is capability infrastructure. <clears throat> Another is collective IQ. And so uh, we say, yes, uh, this, this turns out to be something that I focused on like starting almost 40 years ago is saying that seems to be the term if you're trying to learn how to harness this technology the best that uh, let's consider the, the sort of capability that it's going to produce in people and organizations. <coughs> <coughs> So anyway, the paradigms that have been guiding and applying the, uh, <clears throat> the evolution in the past or in the current like that are sort of, to, to me, they're, they're too limited. And so part of what I hope to do out of getting people interacting and involving in this kind of framework is to help extend and get uh, paradigms that are more appropriate. <clears throat> so how about this in, in capability infrastructure thing? Well, I used to call it a hierarchy, and, and somebody, after a couple of years of that, pointed out that this isn't hierarchy. I'd say, oh, absolutely not. Oh, well, don't call it that then. <laughs> so infrastructure is a term. See, I'm unflappable. That was like three, quite a few years afterwards, but I smile and say, okay, people are always teaching me better. So anyway, the infrastructure in this sense means that any of these capability blobs in an organization is usually dependent on other subordinate capabilities. You know, if you say, well, we want to have the capability for having a team meeting and get together. Well, they have to have a take capability for alerting everybody, communicating with them. Uh, they have to have the capability for organizing a meeting or the terminology for what you call a committee meeting. If somebody's going to take minutes or something, there's some conventions at that or something. But anyway, all up, way up and down the line, they're, they're it's really an infrastructure of capabilities. And you can't suddenly just say, oh, the, com the company's core competencies, that would be the top level capabilities, we've got to focus on them. Sure you do, but you can't really make significant changes in them without looking down into the hierarchy to see what other candidates are changed. So let's just go another step. He says, okay. So people, let's, this, is, this is where I ran into a, a real I, w I guess I was flapped in the 70s that um, we were doing this augmenting and we had a system that later on in the colloquium that will start describing a lot of the things it had which were truly unique. <clears throat> and uh, we were really out for augmenting and we assuming that every knowledge worker is going to be equipped with a personal computer and what you want to do with it besides, well, collaborate and do all this stuff. So then what happened that the popular term became office automation. So the picture was that this technology was there to automate your office work. 
and principally the secretary. So the, the, the principal user to be concerned with was the secretary then in their terms. And this is the thing that just taught me one of the real, real lessons about paradigms. Because what did it do? It just put me out of business. The, my research money dropped, dropped to zero because you got, you know, you're going in the wrong direction. And you're way too complicated because, you know, compared to today's array of tools and things like that, it wasn't that at all, uh, et cetera. So anyway, uh, and there are many things then that, that got installed into the computer world that uh, I think still show paradigm imbalance. The, and one of them is WYSIWYG. See? It's uh, what you see is what you get. And uh, they were very, very proud of themselves for being able to have the screen resolution, et cetera, and the software, et cetera, that you could make it look like a real page with font on it. And so just oriented that, that the whole point of what you're going to do is, in the end, is to print it out and so you'll see what you're going to get there. And that was the thing. And we start out in the 60s by saying, well, hey, being on the computer has a lot of advantages. And, and that's where that scaling thing, hey, there's some surprising sort of changes that you can be offered. If scaling brings you this much capability and horsepower, hey, let's just say I could do things different from what the old book technology did. Oh, one of them right away was I have quick options of how the view is. Well, just show me the first line of every paragraph. This just helped a great deal in finding a way around. And many other things that we ended up with view specifications that had maybe 30 to 40 different kind of viewing configurations that you have. And you get to learn to use them. And you just miss them a lot if all you can do is scroll. See? So the paradigm is still hooked on that. That that's the way almost every system I see is built like that. So anyway, there are, there are other things about the interface too I'll talk about later. So here's a big thing that you say, oh yes, we're putting this together and all these tools are great and we have to realize that the basic human capabilities lie at the bottom of this infrastructure and that in the end, almost all the capability you do have up there depends on it and some aspects of it and it's like that as well as on the tool systems as well as, oh look, on skills and knowledge and training that that basic human creature has so that you know how to use all this stuff. Oh, it's not just that stuff, is it? No, there's a bunch of other stuff that you just grow up learning about. And this whole set then is what we call the augmentation system, that people that are born with a very basic set of, of elemental capabilities have to learn about all the rest of this before they can be effective in society. And it becomes then if you're operating at a given capability domain out in here, oops, sorry, wasn't ready, in a given capability domain in here like that, you have to, you go to school to become a very a professional this or that, and a lot of training. Well, the very way in which those roles are integrated into the team that you'd call a company or a, an agency or something of that sort is also in the human system. And you say, wow, look, this technology, explosive, it's going to change a lot more than just the way you look at so you don't have to look at page things and scroll anymore. You could, oh wow, pretty soon you find that all throughout this infrastructure here, there are real candidates for harnessing the, the technology and harnessing lower level capabilities that got modified. And that whole infrastructure is due, is bound to make a lot of change in it as organizations evolve to learn how to harness all this thing. So that's, to me, that's, a, that's the unfinished revolution. And, and I, I was kind of uneasy last year when it was Engelbart's unfinished revolution. I kept saying, hey, no, it's, it's humankind's uh, revolution that's going to come about. And I just want to get it pointed out enough to get enough people moving on it so I can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so this is a big part of that. So, just, so this is another way of looking at organizations take a long time to do their stepwise changes and their change time constants for change are very much slower than the environment's changing now. So this is going to lead to some real problems. So anyway, we have some very interesting potentials out here and so one of them is oh, I uh, I'm unflappable, I had the wrong one out there. So 
So here I am. Can we get that camera on that book? So Peter Yim last uh, spring pointed out to me that there was this group of people working on the scenarios for the future on a really global scale. Yeah, on a really global scale. And he'd been serving as part of a, one of the committees in the committee structure that had been evolving this kind of state of the future picture on a global basis for the last three or four years. So we're, we're uh, lucky enough to have inveigled a, a video clip voluntarily made by uh, Jerry, Jerry Glenn. So we switch back to the slide, please. So the, uh, one of the principal instigators and coordinators of this effort of producing these state of the future books, which are just very, very interesting. And uh, they've isolated 15 major global sort of <coughs> vectors that need watching. So Jerry Glenn, who's now the executive director of the American Council for the UN University and the co-director of the Mill Millennium Project. So we're going to start a clip now of a few minutes. To, he'll just going to give you a picture. But the big thing is there's an activity been going for some years looking at this big picture. And the scale of the problems he's going to point out are just very large. Okay, Ron? Okay, Ron? <laughs> what am I doing wrong? We all know that the world is getting much more complex. Systems uh, to handle these, these complex situations are not all in place. We are finding new kinds of diseases, new kinds of terrorism, uh, new kinds of governance problems with water and ethnic uh, conflicts we haven't seen before. We know the world is interdependent. We know that there's decreasing lead time to address the kinds of problems I've just mentioned. So we really have to improve the way we think and anticipate about the future. One of the ways we're trying to improve thinking about the future is we created what is called the Millennium Project, which has identified about 550 futures and scholars around the world who work for governments and United Nations organizations and NGOs and universities. Um, they uh, come from all walks of life and different disciplines. And they're trying to take a look at all this complexity. And they've identified developments that could make a change uh, in the future. They've identified issues and opportunities. And these have been merged into 15 global challenges we face in the future. And I'd like to very briefly read them to you. They go into greater detail in this book called The State of the Future, but uh, very briefly, the, the challenges that we think have to be addressed, that we have to begin to address very seriously right now, is one, how can sustainable development be achieved for all? How can we get good, clean, safe water for all people, but without conflict? Many of the watersheds around the world go across borders, and there's tensions right now about, about that. How can population growth and resources be brought into balance? How can genuine democracy, not just makeshift votes, but genuine democracy, emerge from authoritarian regimes and dictatorships? How can global long-term perspectives be b more frequently used in policy making? We keep making decisions and getting short, uh, short, quick solutions that aren't really that. And we know we've got to take the long range into account. How do we do that? How can globalization and the convergence of information and communications technologies uh, be made to work for all people? How can ethical markets increase uh, economic growth and reduce the development gap? What can be done to reduce the threat of new and re-emerging diseases and the increasing number of immune microorganisms? How can the capacity to make correct decisions be improved as institutions and the nature of work is changing all around the world? How can shared values and new security strategies reduce ethnic conflict and new kinds of terrorism? How can the increasing increasing changes in the status of women improve the human condition? How can organized crime be stopped from becoming more powerful, sophisticated global enterprises? How can the growing energy demand be met, but safely met for us all as we grow into a larger, more complex future with more people and increasing income? 
How can the most effect, one of the most effective ways to accelerate scientific breakthroughs and technological applications to improve the human condition for all? How can ethical considerations become more routinely incorporated into global decisions? All of these are complex issues that require global systems that are not either in place or well understood. And I look forward to your thoughts on how we can make this all more effective in the future. <clears throat> I, I, I almost feel like saying thank you, Jerry. Uh, we're going to see there's going to be another clip or so he's made, and also he's scheduled to come by and visit uh, visit us uh, later in this colloquium. Um, so next, <clears throat> uh, another big problem is world energy supply. And um, a, friend, a good friend of mine, Hugh Crane, has been telling me about this for years. And he's been, he kept telling me about the great knowledgeable guy he's teamed up with, Ed Kinderman. And uh, so uh, he was going to come by later with his kind of picture of it, not today. <coughs> and Ed Kinderman uh, is going to, he's putting on a clip. So Ed, Ed's here today, where'd you sit? Right here. Right here. Oh, there he is. So anyway, he gets to watch himself. Are you flappable? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's have Ed about energy. About the energy industry. It is large, essential, and growing. It may not be the largest, but it certainly underlies all human activity in the industrial world. At the current rates of growth, the energy industry will increase by a factor of three and a half between now and 2050. However, problems loom. Reaching such goals will not be easy. The problems are large and they're not easily solved. But they need attention now if we are to succeed in solving them in adequate time. I'm going to speak briefly about the general area now for the next or in the next few minutes. But we will discuss this later in more detail. One of the major problems is our dependency upon oil. It amounts to 40% of our total energy use, mainly because it's the most flexible of all the fuels and energy sources we have. <clears throat> but the problem is that oil, like all fossil fuels, is limited in extent. It was formed over many centuries and has not, and is being formed still, but at very, very low rates compared to its use, its rates of use. In addition to being our most flexible and desirable fuel, we have the problem that oil is unevenly distributed around the world, like all other fossil fuels. And oil is particularly concentrated in the Middle East in the former Soviet Union, which uh, today at least are areas of considerable conflict and turmoil. So we must ask the question, what are we going to do when or as oil begins to come in s short supply? Are we going to substitute other fossil fuels such as gas or coal? Well, Gas is more difficult to use, although it is cleaner overall than oil. And coal is reasonably easy to use, falling perhaps between oil and gas. But it is much dirtier than the other two. If we don't do that, we have some choices. The first and most touted is the Reduce, reduction in the rate of growth 
of our demand for energy. This is easily said, but very difficult to do on a worldwide scale, especially since we have a developing world with a large population that is beginning to demand the amenities that energy supplies to the developed world. If we don't, if we don't succeed in cutting our growth in energy demand by substantial amounts, then we must depend very heavily on alternatives that are very li little used today. Related energy supplies today are primarily those from hydropower, which contributes roughly 10% of the total commercial energy used in the world. The others are truly negligible, together amounting to no more than 0.4%. They have uh, several impediments to their use. There are technical developments necessary, but perhaps the most important ones are the fact that they generally require large land areas. For example, if one were to grow enough biomass to supply the energy now supplied to the world by oil, one would have to grow crops at very high rates of yield over the entire continental United States. Another difficulty is the lack of availability. Biomass can be grown and stored, but those uh, technologies that depend upon direct sunlight, such as photovoltaic cells or solar thermal technologies, only operate well when the sun is shining. Wind power uh, varies with time, but in a different way. And none, none of them can be guaranteed to operate and supply energy at times when people wish to use it. Certainly, solar technology at nighttime is not feasible without energy storage, which adds complexity to any system as well as cost. Nuclear power also supplies about 10% of the world's energy supply when we count it on a primary energy basis. It is, its technology is further developed than most of the solar technologies, but it definitely faces a different set of social and political problems that must be resolved if its use is to grow and if it is to be, become a significant source for the future. I've been very upfront in pointing out there are problems and I've suggested they need to be solved rather soon. At least we have to begin to solve them soon. One difficulty in this is the fact that we do not have a well-informed discourse or dialogue among various people. The first difficulty is one of the units and degree of understanding of these units that various people have. It's very confusing when we read of barrels of oil or tons of oil or barrels of oil per day and we put thousands and millions connected to them. Some people don't recognize the difference between the thousand and million when they make a conversion. We've seen it in technical publications. The way we have tried to solve this problem is to invent a new unit, the cubic mile of oil. This represents about one trillion gallons of oil and we've used that equivalent energy content to represent all other sources of energy, whether they be solar, nuclear, gas, or coal. But 
this unit will not solve the problem. This unit may make discussion easier. It is essential that we begin dialogue that considers the needs of humanity as a whole, of the environment, and of all aspects of society. Energy is the key to our modern society. And how many more cubic miles <clears throat> do we think there is? Are. Lots of argument about that, but the conservative estimate would be slightly less than 40. And if we use oil at increasing the rate that we're new, doing now, the world will run out in about 40, less than 40 years, 25, 30 years. <clears throat> okay, very good. So, um, thank you. And uh, so, we uh, sort of look for me then the many years ago as I was looking, I said, okay, this would be a, a very good goal to try to see how much one could improve the mankind's collective ability to deal with complex, urgent problems. So as one gets to look at it in the kind of scale in which they exist, you begin to this uh, subtle thing of, why didn't I realize that at the outset, that, oh, purposely pursuing that goal is itself a very complex and ever-increasingly urgent challenge. So he says, oh, that's interesting. So these are, these are things that, that were, uh, I wrote up in a, this framework book that was published in 1962 as a technical report. And uh, a sort of a pared down thing that somebody else uh, abstracted uh, was later put into a chapter in a book. But that's, that was sort of the genesis for pulling these things together, etc. And so, there were some diag some things in there, the diagrams that, that uh, I can look at and saying, oh, look, if does that come through at all? Yeah. Oh, great, better than I thought. If uh, if here's the world supplying information, etc., and here's the program that gets going to try to improve the capability to do complex things. He says, oh boy, the faster that gets going, let's feed it right back in so it's employing these new capabilities to do its work about how do you develop new capabilities. So I used an engineering term of bootstrapping to talk about it back then and then just say, well, if the world's certainly going to get turned on to that pretty soon and get going on it, and when they do, look, oh, there's quite a bit more to it than shows up there, but I guess you can zoom it. Uh, it began to be a, a sort of a, a, a network of, of kinds of activities, some of them feeding back and others, etc. And the very top one is really saying that which is attacking the world's really goals. So this, this set me out on this bootstrapping sense, and it, it steered very much the kind of research pursuits we did in the 60s and 70s. You know, saying, okay, if we're going to learn to do collective work better, let's really do it, but if we're not going to sit there and write reports just to tell the world about it, we're going to show them. We're going to have to do it ourselves. So everything we built, et cetera, was to improve the capability of the environment we lived in, and we all lived in it. And there wasn't exactly a homogenous perception about what that would be like. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a category of, of workers that's called software people, right, who seem to have some of their own pictures about what ought to be done, the world evolved, and that was a paradigm lesson too. But, but as that got going, then we got the, this other paradigm that the rest of the world just thought we were really, really in the wrong direction. But this whole pr pursuit in here is sort of, the, sort of the foundation for the kind of things I'm telling you about now. There's a lot of lessons learned, and, and a lot of them you know, instead of being f getting flapped and getting all morose and grumpy about the world because, hey, they shut down my research, it was just saying, oh, that is a real sign of paradigm. 
And so, uh, then the challenge becomes not so you know not uh, not only just thinking of clever things you can do about tools and methods, etc., to improve work, but how do you get the world moving in that direction? And in that sense, I've been a very very poor uh, marketeer and salesman about that because you know the unfinished thing. So I think it's time that the world really says this is a very very important target for us to do to go after and let's go after it. And that means going after the collective capability. And that takes both academic and then sort of engineering and real world applications, sort of all interacting and talking with each other about that. So this, this then leads to a, the step of looking at this capability infrastructure and saying, oh, we have to give new importance to the capability within any organization's infrastructure that serves to do it's improving its own capability infrastructure. Okay, so that does apply there. So that was just just great. So that that's part of the bootstrapping then is how do you how do you get people's improvement infrastructures to be very active, etc. And so that's another term, improvement infrastructure, and that's a subset of the capability infrastructure for any organization. And one of the things then, and listening to the global problems, you realize, oh, in one way you can just put the whole of mankind into this capability infrastructure box and say, oh, what's the ability of mankind to take care of these global problems that Jerry Glenn was talking about and Ed was talking about? So that's a very clear capability that has to be there, and it's not doing very well now, that this kind of thing, and that in 40 years, you know, we'd run out well, 40 years is pretty short time for the change time constants of many of our larger organizations and especially large political groups and such like that. So it just, and the other things we'll be talking about today of that sort too. So one of the things we're getting at is the scale of the problem. You know, if you're going to get large groups of people to be more capable of doing their collective thing, so you're talking about, you know, uh, well, we sort of categorize them a little later. But let's 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 switch. Let's well, the next clip we'll have is by uh, Pat Rush, Dr. Rush, uh, who came on the scene a little over a year ago, and she and her colleague Mary Dye uh, were pretty active in kind of helping us push towards doing all this thing. And she's got an MBA, so she's mixed both both the management of hospitals and the such in with in with the uh, actual practices, and she's really become almost totally concerned with how to improve the, uh, the health service state. So can we run that clip, please? Hi, I'm Pat Rush. I'm a physician in Chicago, and I'm going to talk about some of the urgent and complex problems that are facing health care today. I'm a geriatrician and a primary care physician, and I feel that there are many problems in health and health care that could benefit from the bootstrapping approach of Doug Engelbart and the Bootstrap Institute. One of the most critical problems facing all of us, health care providers and patients, is the emergence of new and drug-resistant infectious diseases in the world. Sorry. Um, this has been identified as one of the top 15 problems facing us in the 20th, 21st century. I'll do that again. This has been identified as one of the top 15 problems facing us going into the 21st century. Great progress has been made in the fight against infections and infectious disease. And in many ways, up until the past few years, we were lulled into a feeling of false sense of security. Infectious disease still kills more persons than any other disease and causes more pain and suffering worldwide. Previously unknown infectious diseases are, re are emerging at an unprecedented rate. I'll do that again. Previously unknown infectious diseases are emerging at an unprecedented rate. Over 20 new infectious diseases have emerged in the past 30 years, including the Ebola virus, 
the HIV viruses which cause AIDS, and hepatitis C. For most of these diseases, there is no treatment, no cure, and no vaccine. Meanwhile, in developed countries, we are also facing um, emergence of, of microorganisms that are resistant to antibiotics. These include uh, common bacteria that all humans are exposed to, like Staphylococcus and Enterococcus, and also to more rare organisms or organisms that were considered rare 20 years ago, like tuberculosis, gonorrhea, and malaria, which is now emerging as a problem in the United States. Meanwhile, also rare diseases, deadly diseases like bubonic plague and smallpox are felt to be at risk of emerging on a global basis. These problems affect developed and undeveloped nations worldwide. What is going on here? We have to ask ourselves as scientists, how did this happen? 20 years ago, we were claiming that we had conquered many infectious diseases and felt that we had removed these, uh, the risk of infection worldwide. We understand now that we were uh, had incomplete knowledge and were somewhat naive in understanding what causes infectious disease. We were equally naive and incomplete in our understanding of what cures infectious disease. So basically we have to go back to baseline and figure out um, how we're going to approach this going forward. This is an urgent and complex problem. One thing we know for sure is we cannot proceed as we have been. The microorganisms are able to outsmart us faster than we're able to develop new antibiotics that can eradicate disease. So we need a new approach, we need a global approach. I believe that this is a perfect problem to which to apply the bootstrapping technology developed by Doug Engelbart and the Bootstrap Alliance. Already, the World Health Organization and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control have established a worldwide network, although I don't believe it's considered a, at this point a network improvement community, as you will hear Doug talk about. What the networked improvement community could do is not only to outline the problem, but to explicitly look at what knowledge we do have, what knowledge we don't have, and how to improve our improvement process. This could lead to a readily accessible, dynamic knowledge repository, ever-changing, ever-growing, as our information and knowledge increases. This will clearly, because we are inter, uh, internationally in, interdependent, we will also need international cooperation. Within nations, we will need cooperation of the public, not-for-profit, and for-profit sectors, including government agencies, public health officials, health care providers, pharmaceutical companies, and even all of us at home who choose to use or not use antibiotics or um, other kinds of cleaning materials that may in fact be adding to the uh, problem of antibiotic resistance. This is an urgent and complex problem and something I feel would, uh, could be greatly helped through widespread adoption of the bootstrap technology. <clears throat> so the pictures grow <clears throat> that you realize that, uh, you know, that the kind of distribution of the capabilities to deal with complex knowledge and arguments and issues and policies, etc., uh, you know, are widespread. You, you don't get that by isolated show, you know, cases where uh, you know, a few different organizations can exercise uh, really neat special techniques that is, well anyway, we'll get into that more later. But, um, so we have another one right now too. Uh, what I call the, the uh, state of the biotechnology, which is just sort of one aspect. <clears throat> Kurt Carlson is the president and CEO of SRI, and he's becoming more and more 
uh, active and interested in what we're doing is actually uh, helping make SRI be sort of a partner in, in getting things moving. Yeah. And uh, we'll tell more about that today. And unfortunately, to keep SRI moving well, he's had to do some active uh, CEOing this afternoon. <laughs> but he'll be here for the uh, reception. So watch and listen and maybe corner him and ask some questions. The next century is going to be a um, extremely exciting time. Um, it's going to be a period of great opportunity. Um, I think we all uh, feel that, um, as well as being a century with great issues and risks. Why do I say that? Well, um, for the first time, we're going to get a real convergence between information technology and biotechnology. By the year 2020, we should have on our desktop a computer that has the raw computing speed of the human brain. That's kind of the four minute mile for computing. And after that, if Moore's Law continues, um, it'll keep going faster and faster until the year 2070 or so. We should have on our desktop a computer that goes faster than the entire uh, computing power of the world's population. Obviously, when we have that kind of computer on our desktop, we have a different kind of relationship um, with our PC. At the same time, developments in biotech are beginning to emerge that will have um, an important um, interaction with those developments. Today, we're decoding the human genome, but that's just the beginning. And we're building um, silicon chips that allow us to take uh, traditional biotech laboratories and um, shrink them down um, to a desktop computer. But we're still in the very early days of biological computing. It's a little bit like uh, the transition from slide rules to the first um, computers. They still are very limited in their capability. But by the year 2020 or so, we'll have um, biological chips that can do real computation and will begin to uh, significantly uh, be able to modify the um, genetic structure of not only plants, but also of animals. And the, <clears throat> the kind of distinctions that we think about between biological systems and silicon systems will begin to blur and eventually go away. We'll have modified um, 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 plants and animals, uh, but we'll also have the opportunity to integrate silicon processing power into biological systems as well. Um, clearly, there are reasons, uh, good reasons, for wanting to do uh, these sorts of things. They allow you to um, extend life, to enhance human capabilities, um, and to solve some of the major health problems um, around the world. And um, it's interesting that in order to fully realize the potential of these kinds of capabilities, uh, Doug's ideas of bootstrapping become even more important. Um, in order to be able to fully pull together the different technologies, biotech, materials, integrated circuit technology, uh, chemistry, all to be able to uh, make these opportunities happen, um, Doug's ideas of uh, constant iteration and bootstrapping uh, become really essential. It becomes uh, really the paradigm for how to do R&D um, in the next century. At the same time, there are obviously uh, various risks that come out of these kinds of developments. Um, one major risk is that of, of biowarfare in all of its forms. Um, these technologies um, turn out to be easier to do um, rather than harder as we get to understand them more. And as a result, the risks will become uh, more ubiquitous and more uh, pervasive. Um, today, as you know, it takes um, over a decade to develop um, a new drug. Um, and that's completely unacceptable in uh, the next century. What we really need to do is to integrate these technologies together so that we can discover a new drug in 48 hours, from detection to deployment of the vaccine. And again, the only way to do that kind of program is by the kind of aggressive bootstrapping uh, that's been pioneered by Doug. There'll be other risks, and um, 
they have to do more with um, social and political realities than technical realities. I believe that um, the technological um, scenarios that we, we think about um, and talk about will pretty much come true. I think we will learn how to do these things. So I see very little risk there of those developments happening. But at the same time, these developments are going to happen very rapidly on an unprecedented time scale and they're going to interact very strongly with the way people um, think about the world, what they think about, how they think about humanity, and ultimately um, how they touch core religious beliefs, uh, beliefs that people have around the world. And if we don't um, treat that larger community seriously and interact with that in the same way that we will be interacting with the technology, and bootstrapping the collective consciousness, not only on the technological side, but also on the social and political side, then you can almost guarantee that there'll be major disruptions as we go forward into the next century. So I hope that we will develop the kind of communities um, that will enable us um, to make that happen. And there's more. <laughs> you know, we could have a long parade of people pointing out really, really, you know, serious issues. And some of them, you know, when I, in the 60s, with all that nice rebellion going on, I became aware of things in the, in the sort of uh, spiritual domain and thinking, oh, boy, if you solve that, then you wouldn't need to worry because most of the other problems wouldn't get painful, you know, people learn how to adapt. And then I realized that if you try to get the world really a program to bring their spirituality up and everything, you'd have to do a lot of communication and distribution and agreement and develop vocabularies. Oh, you're right back to how valuable it would be if you could augment our capabilities. So uh, this is sort of a circuitous thing that I managed to justify my doing this all the years. Uh, anything else important? Well, yeah. Uh, okay, then um, we're back to this picture enough just to start realizing that the, the, the changes that are coming about in themselves are going to cause and complicate everything. That say trans transportation getting a lot better. Well, people are going to be carrying their, their bacteria and their viruses around with them more and distributing uh, <coughs> It's just a lot of problems. I, the people can say, oh, telecommuting is going to solve it. Sure. And then pretty soon, I've just been saying for years, oh, it's going to be very interesting. Then all of the, the government forms of local and, and state and so on that depend for significant revenue upon sales taxes or something or business taxes, how are they going to sort of settle that problem when you say, no, the company I'm working for is, is in Singapore or Hong Kong or Germany or something. So uh, don't, you know, it's, anyway. Anyway, so I saw on PBS the other day the, a real, real go-round getting going about state governors really trying to say, you know, they're, they're slipping away too much of the revenue that we've been depending upon, and it's unfair. So, big problem. So anyway, and the problems aren't just, just mechanical solving complex engineering problems or something. It's solving political, social problems, etc. Uh, of solving the problem of, of immovable paradigms, which uh, sometimes is so sort of important. All right, I uh, made a mistake here, and I'm not flapping about it, but this first line under problem should have been down, and should have, is duplicated down below. So the problem part of this thing, the exploding rate and scale of change, that there really get to be a vicious cycle of urgency and complexity and global scale that are going to be wrenching, and those are going to get more. And they're getting more because we're getting more globally active and, and globally integrated in all of the kind of things we're doing. And a lot of that's due to the technology, which is going to cause disparities and all sorts of problems. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, so the opportunities are there about, hey, we can boost our capacity for effective collection action. So this, this just comes right back. And talking about problems that, uh, so there's a young man sitting uh, sitting right there in his seat that uh, has been active with the uh, nanotechnology people in the community, and we were going to get 
uh, some films with it, but we just didn't have the bandwidth to put all this together. But we're going to have some some more, and uh, I'm going to tag you for talking about some of the complexities that are rising out of that, as well as the <coughs> stupendous possibilities that are there. So we just take a look at how we're going to do something about increasing our capability to handle things collectively. Well, it's just basically unavoidable that you have to have collective knowledge in order to do that. And in the past, that's all been hard copy. And the pace that's going now, you realize that no, there's just not time for the hard copy to change. It's not dynamic enough. It's not transportable enough, etc. So the, it's just inevitable that the future is going to be all hypermedia, multimedia, hypermedia. And the hyper comes out because the interlinkage is just a critical innovation. It just, it just goes back. That's one of the things coming out of that book. It's just inevitable. <laughs> and um, so we say, <clears throat> my lifetime goal then got a little bit of addition. So not only the goal to make it possible to boost mankind's collective capacity for coping with complex urgent problems, but this observation that that pursuit is itself a complex urgent problem. So strategy as make headway in goal A, then apply its new capability gains to the pursuit of A. So call it the bootstrap strategy. So that's according to the diagrams I was showing you there, but that, that really is something. So that strategy begins to evolve into bigger and bigger scale strategic concerns when it's doing that to try to do something significant. So during the course of the colloquium, we're going to be trying to, trying to get the, the picture. If I just give you one short picture, the kind of strategic issues and concepts and guidelines that I think are going to be necessary, they're just pretty hard just to absorb until you sort of get for yourself this backdrop of the complexity that's there and uh, the kind of integration throughout most of the population of the world of a lot of the new things that are going to happen, including new vocabularies, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. So in, in making the picture long ago about how does a group of people interacting start doing that, that there are these three categories of sort of knowledge packages that, that grew out pretty much. That we like to think about the recorded dialogue. Well, email has been making a big difference in that. But that also means every submitted paper in a journal, every news item that's in here like that, every letter to the editor, etc., and then every serious book or uh, review of it or a commentary. And that the, the, you know, this is going to change from whole books to just getting more and more. It's be an evolution of the core kind of concepts and arguments and discourse going on. Because there won't be time that you look at a, somebody that's a specialist in a field that's going to put out a, a textbook that defines that field every, what, two years or something? It's hard work to do that. Well, you know, things are going to be changing faster and faster. Some people have sort of said that in another 20 years, the world's knowledge will be doubling how often? Well, it's been 100 years lately. It's been 500 years quite a while ago. Well, in 20 years, they say, it'll probably be doubling every three months. So at that rate, and that rate is just going to be with us, the rate of change, how do you, how do you integrate enough so that you can keep track of it to be useful? So it's not just a problem for any one person or any one university crew or anything like that. It's a problem for every organization. It has to keep track of what's going on in the outside world. And uh, doing that, the complexity of changing. And so you need this int intelligence collection and you need, you need this business of integrating the top. It's a very critical issue that is not going to be served by having a good search tool, etc. That's just, you know, it's everybody that wants to find out what the current status of a big complex project or a big issue that's handling a political thing has to go look at all of the dialogue about it. You haven't done something. So somehow, that our social organizations, et cetera, have to solve this problem of doing the integrating in shorter and shorter, faster ways in more and more complex sort of environments. So that's a big, big chart, big, big challenge in there like that. So we call this dynamic repository, knowledge repository. 
and DKR for short, and say, you know, learning how to establish and, and maintain and keep up to date a DKR that really gives you the picture of what's happening outside of your organization that's effective and what's happening inside and being able to control your changes and your thoughts and your avoidance of problems and your taking advantage of new opportunities. So that's just very dynamic. So that's a big thing and we'll be talking about a lot of the aspects of that over the coming weeks. And uh, it's, it has, it, it takes advantage of a lot of the research and stuff that's going on in the world. And Terry here has just contributed a great deal. And it's got a much bigger environment that any one team or academic girl can, can handle. And uh, no one knows how yet. So it's one of the real problems. <clears throat> so one of the big problems that's there is that suppose there's an organizational unit down here that's doing a pretty good job of its dynamic repository. But it happens to be part of a much larger group. So this might be a design group at Boeing and here's the whole airplane. So each of these groups has to keep its dynamic repository relevant and dynamic to do its job. But at the same time, the overall one has to do that too, which has to be integrated. They all have to be integrated together. So this integration there goes farther and farther. The whole air, airspace industry has to be like this with all the vendors and parts in it too. So this is this infrastructure of interoperative organizations and institutions and social units throughout the world all has to maintain that. <clears throat> so for stability, et cetera, for mankind just to know. The fractures that appear cause wars or all kinds of stuff. <coughs> so, so that concurrency makes a really big problem out of it. So it just leads to saying that the standards for the way our knowledge packages are made and the vocabulary by which we talk about the objects in it and what you can do to those objects to show, to move, to, to respond to, to track, backtrack, etc., has to be a uniform, wide vocabulary. And it, <coughs> simply, it just simply won't fly on this scale to think of that vocabulary being established by the vendors of the tool systems at all. So this brings out the just absolute necessity of the end user organizations becoming really proactive about the way the standards in the community and the functionality that they want and the co-evolution of their own internal processes and customs and practices along with the tools rather than having the tools be shoved because they're a money-making thing right now. Sure, I can't argue with the market for it's such a tried thing for being able to get cheaper and cheaper and better brooms and stoves and things like that. But when you're into an area in which the, the customer is organization, collective groups of people is the real customer in there, and they're not able to be good consumers because they're not got it together yet about what they need and what the future can do. So it says, okay, you can't blame the vendors for shoving them around in a way that will probably be kind of laughable I mean, assuming we do get a lot smarter about getting smarter, that in, in 15 or 10 years or 20, I think it'd be really interesting for them, you guys, to look back and, and sort of chuckle about a lot of the world views about the way that this information technology world is going to be moving, or was moving at the time. Picture like that. So it's our own fault. So anyway, we adopted this term Kodiak as an acronym for concurrent, Development, Integration, and Application of Knowledge. There just wasn't enough that knowledge management has become a term in the, uh, the uh, world a lot in the last years. And later on, Marcelo Hoffman, who's been specializing for SRI's Business Intelligence Unit and watching that can sort of give us a talk about all that. But it, it isn't wide and deep enough what has to be done. So... <clears throat> Here we begin to talk about the co-evolution term. And so this is a very simplified way of looking at it, of saying if there were only one dimension to the technology and tools and only one dimension to how you adapted to it in the organization, you'd have this two-dimensional frontier. So what's really inter interesting, and I just, a lot of need out there for people to help get the dimensionality of these two vectors 
oriented a lot so you can get a better picture for what the evolutionary path out through that space, because it won't be just a two-dimensional space, it'll be a many-dimensional space. But just in two dimensions, it's enough to give you a picture about the challenge, see. So you could just pretend you could go around the world and look at all the different societies or social units and sort of find a way to put them in there. How, how much of the technology that's available today are they using and how much have they integrated it really into the ways in which they operate and work. And so you said you'd get a distribution like this and everybody sort of in, a, in our sort of modern upfront world, I guess, would like to say our organization's right up here, huh? So then it's pretty clear to say, I mean, pretty important to say what can you anticipate today in the way of technology changes beyond what's there now? And what could you anticipate the way you could even today change your, th th these lines shouldn't be straight, by the way, but I don't, I don't have enough patient or I get unflapped or something about trying to make this a better shape. But it's just there for, for sort of demonstration discussion purposes. So anyway, you look at this and say, okay, organizations have been evolving for a long time and always they hear about new things and in some order that they'll start integrating new technology and re-engineering or some other thing and change there. So there's a steady migration in the upward, you know, diagonally up like this. So he says, okay, is this the picture of today? Well, today what you need to do is do a little bit of modification. He says, oh, it's more like that, right? Because, oh, technology is going blasting out of that, so it's opening up a whole new area. So we're, we're moving around from organizations that have, that have been uh, living in this world for a long, long time and all the practices about changing their ways, suddenly they're in here. So he says, oh, the, the task and the cost of migrating out into this space and it's co-evolution and driven by the technology, it's probably going to be a, a, a sort of a, a, a feeble line moving slightly upward from horizontal, <laughs> thing like that. But how do you know it's not going to go this way? So it's a big question then. And you look at the scales of changes that are coming on by the technology and this nanotechnology that we're going to have some discussion with in subsequent sessions too. It just, it's just mind-blowing about what that is going to offer and the impact is going to be very large. So he says, okay, maybe this is much more like what that co-evolutionary frontier is like. Thing. And so are our practices and concerns, the money we're spending on organizational change, on studying it and looking at it like that, are they anything like this, what's sort of required of the scale for adapting, not just, don't, if you would, just adapt to what everybody else does as they're changing the technology if you're not going to change to it. But anyway, it's, it's just going to be a big one. So this is, uh, this is time I think uh, I can take a reasonable break here and uh, uh, let's just see if that five minutes is for true. So we'll see you back in, <laughs> in ten minutes or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank <clears throat> you.